So, we finally finished Colossians. And um, I was praying about what would I should do after that. And a few months ago, I realized that there's connection between Colossians and there's another book that I really want to bring up with you guys and share with you. That is Philemon or Philemon. You know, it depends on how you pronounce it. But in this book, that, and I saw just one chapter show this book that Paul has written. But uh, there's a lot of rich, there's a lot of powerful and, um, and practical um, the, the teachings in there. But there's a, things that really stood out for me in this passage was the conflict and discipleship. Conflict and discipleship. Today, just, I just want to acknowledge as a pastor of the church, I've been doing this with you guys for seven years now, more than seven years. What do you think? Do you think this has always been um, the, the peaceful and no conflict in this church and whatsoever? Uh, no, actually not. And um, up t- till this day, almost weekly basis, daily basis, I hear from different people their own struggles in their own family, their own relationship, also within the church. And if you ask me, what do you do uh, as a pastor in a, beside the preparing sermon? The preparing sermon takes a long time. You know, you ask my wife the, the things that I have to do to come up with uh, sermons each week. It's, it's not easy, right? Although I enjoy it. But other than that, what do I do? I, I don't just play golf every day. Um, well, what's that, Will? What's that? Um, actually, a lot of ministry goes with to the conflict management. Conflict. I mean, you probably wonder, why do we have a conflict in the church? You know, shouldn't Christians all nice to each other, all kind to each other, good to each other? And I also hear people, you know, they used to go to church, active in the church, and they don't go to church anymore. Why don't you go to church anymore? And their answer is because I am sick and tired of the people. You know, I, I'm, just, I'm just happy just by myself. I listen to the, the online sermon, and I, was just, I believe in God. I know I'll go to heaven. A dead, they have a theological excuse, right? But there's something missing in there because what they, uh, what they don't want is conflict in their life, especially when it comes to church. But what I found is from the Bible or from my ministry or from my own life, there is one fundamental truth. Conflict is the necessary journey in the school of discipleship. Conflict is the necessary journey in the school of discipleship. You will not grow ever. You will not grow ever if you do not go through conflicts. When I say conflict, this is what it means. How would you know how to forgive someone? Because that is a discipleship. When you don't meet anyone unforgivable. How do you know how to resolve issue with the grace of Jesus Christ when you have no one around you to challenge your thought or... um, um, pushes you or uh, there was a, they confronted you with the issues of your life. I know, church is a funny thing. When you come together, a whole bunch of people singing songs and uh, having these uh, angelic faces on Sunday. But when it comes to deeper, you know, there is a story of hurting each other and you got offended you get hurt. You get, um, you get treated, mistreated. You feel like an unfair. And you feel like someone's rude to you. And all sorts of these things happening in the church. Right? Which church are you talking about? Not this church. Uh, no, actually, this church as well as every church out there. But mind you, in the Bible, the church is in the Bible. They went through exactly the same thing. And all the teachings of the Bible is a situational and telling people, when you go through this kind of situation, what you need to do to, to resolve the conflict. How you resolve conflict 
shows how much are you following Christ. Discipleship, conflict goes to hand in hand. You will never be the disciples of Jesus until you know how to deal with conflicts in your life. What's the difference between mature and immature people? What's the between, difference between children and adults? Children don't know how to manage the conflict. What do they do instead of managing the conflict? They choke a fit. You know, they, they just like, there's no reason. There's no process. There is no resolution. They just, I want what I want, what I, when I want, you know. That is children. Mature people, as our parents, as adults, we know how to resolve the differences and the manage, manage these uh, different opinions and somehow bring the unity and peace and the love in the family. That's, that's what we do, isn't it? That is basically the foundation of discipleship. So, I found the book that I'm going to read, this whole book, we're going to just study just one sermon today. Maybe I'll come back next week. But I just want to focus on this Philemon, Philemon, the book of the Philemon, how do we manage the conflict in the church? How do we manage the conflicts in the church? Sounds good? I think it's going to be practical, but also it's very, very important for all of you in, your, in the church life, family life, marriage, and everywhere you go. Yep, are you with me? Okay. So let's read the Bible passage first. Philemon, Paul a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apia, uh, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have, toward, you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived uh, the much joy and comfort from your love, my, br uh, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I would prepare to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf, behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he would wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I Paul write this letter, this uh, with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owning, uh, owning me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I'll be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, send, sends greeting to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Damas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, um, with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we are um, your children who are wrestling with your word and struggling to 
become your disciple in this journey, we confess it's hard. It's really hard as a simple man, as a simple people like us. After receiving your grace, it's not automatic. It's not just always easy. That's why we need your help. We need your teaching. We need your guidance. And I pray, Lord God, this morning, would you conjure up that obedience in our heart so that we may know how to please you and we may have a power to truly live out the life to worship you and please you, Lord God, in our walk. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Time for a story. It's a very important story, so you have to listen to me. It's a real-life story, right? And the background of this passage, I've actually briefly mentioned two weeks ago. So this guy, Philemon, who was he? He was a, a Christian. He became a Christian probably through the Paul's ministry, living in Colossae. Yeah? And uh, you know, his name was mentioned in the, the book of Colossae. We, we read about it, right? And uh, it looks like he's a rich guy. He's a very influential guy. And history said that he was, became a like, bishop or pastor of church. And if you look, look into this, like a verse, what's verse 2, it says, and the church in your house, many, meaningly, he might have a huge house, house and, and uh, the people were meeting in his house. Okay, just a little bit of the sidetrack. Here we go. Another house church model, right? That's why we believe in house church. Church was never, was just an institutionalized building. It was not, it was not like that. It was a life they living in. People invited into their life, their household, and they did life together. And that meant to be church. That's something that we lost. All right? So, like uh, they said, that there was uh, the um, John Calvin and Martin Luther, they reformed the theology of salvation, but they couldn't reform the theology of church. They reform the theology of salvation. It just uh, uh, the the righteous will be uh, live by faith, faith alone, right? But when they tried to reform the church, it was too Catholic. Catholicism was too prevailing, so they couldn't do it. So it was a very institutionalized church. We maintaining that up until now. But when you go back to the Bible, house churches are all around. I'm not just saying the house. Church doing it house. I'm doing about. The, I'm talking about church doing life together. I'm just still trying to work that out. Trying to you know we're wrestling with that. We make a success. We fail here and there, but there was a right struggle. I really believe in that. Anyway, Philemon was a shepherd or pastor of a house church, and he probably have a, a several slaves. In those days, slaves is very common. And historian says maybe one-third of Roman population was slaves. slaves. But some said even half of the Roman population was slaves. Back then, slaves were not like the slaves that we are, are like, uh, like the recent slaves that we know of in Rome, uh, like we said, the American history. Like it's not about one race. It's not about these underprivileged people. In those days, slaves are like some of them, like even doctors, some are librarian, some are educated, and some are accountant. Right? They are like a well managed. They are well looked after because there was a time the Roman. Uh, the Roman history, the slave was harshly treated, just a property, or they're not considered as a man, still as a property, but, you know, then the, a lot of, they saw this, uh, uh, the, like, a uh, revolution, and there's all those other, so the unhappy slaves are hard to manage, so they figured, okay, we make the slaves happy, happy slaves are better to have, um, so it's actually a bit different relationship, but still, Slaves are slaves. And one of the slaves that on, uh, the Philemon had was Onesimus. Everybody said Onesimus. Okay, you said it right now, right? Next time I ask you who is Onesimus, you don't say it to me. I never heard of it. I went to the meet retreat. I asked everybody, do you know who Onesimus is? Dude? No one knew, including my wife. So it's my fault. Actually, to be honest, I never preached from these books ever. I realized, oh my goodness, okay, I can't blame any one of you. Now I can blame you. All right, do you know who Onesimus is? Onesimus is a slave. And we find that in Philemon, this book of Philemon, we see that he's not just ordinary other slaves. He was runaway slaves. Now, 
How did runaway slave treated in those days? This is very important. One, if he get caught, you don't need to have a reason. You get executed, right? You be and you are you are just property, right? And then and then, then if you are found that some uh, the form of a grace or pardon from the master, and you get to have this big F sign on your forehead, like engraved, tattooed. Meaning the fugitive, that is where the fugitive comes from. He walks around for the entire his life with a big F sign in his head. Meaning that he was a slave, once run away. This Onesimus was run away slaves. He was non-Christian. And when he was in Rome, he encountered Paul, who was in the prison house arrest. We don't know exactly how that happened, but he accepted Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. He became a Christian. Now, probably conversation went around like this. And Paul goes, you know, so where you come from? Where did you run away from? Well, across the, oh yeah, which way? Do you know? I know there's some church there. Do you know Philemon? Yeah, he was my master. <laughs> wow, really? Wow. So, you know, how, how do you deal with this? Like, yeah, mind you. You're probably wondering how does Christian can condone slavery, right? See, that's the thing. Now, I'm going to get to that too as well. But, you know, for Paul, his ultimate focus, ultimate, his, uh, the life goal is not the social reform. He's not really on about creating the utopia on, on the earth. His actually mind is so fixed on the world to come, the, the home they are going, the heaven that he saw heavenly man. So when he saw slaves, he actually teaching for these people. It is in Colossians, in Ephesians, he talks about, hey, if you are called as a slave, be a good slave. Good to you, be obedient to your master, right? Because you are not slave in Christ. For those people who are called as a free, you remember that you are slave to Christ when you are called. See? So Paul sees the situation completely differently. So he never, you know, this is kind of a very tricky situation though. Okay. Because he's there. Why is there in Rome? To present himself before the, the emperor. Right? We, we learned this from the book of Acts, remember? To make sure he understands that Christianity is not the threat to the empire. We are not trying to disturb the peace you know, or social structure here. So he was going to, his, his, uh, his, uh, his mission is to, to tell them that you, uh, what we believe in is not going to harmful for your empire, right? That's what he was going to do. Now, the slave came to his, um, to, to his, uh, his uh, community and we found that he's a runaway slave. He's a fugitive. He's a criminal. Now, in those days, if anybody who accept or kind of hide the slave, uh, slave, runaway slave, he, they are accountable for all the, uh, all the things that actually meant to happen to him in a way, right? So financially, um, or, I, I, you know, there's a, maybe the, he has to be responsible for all the things that he caused. And that's why the letter, you know, Paul saying that. Now, in the church, Colossian church, we just studied there. The, the grace of Jesus Christ was just preached and shown. And, but there was a master and there were slaves as well. And they bound to have the conflict. And this background that we just heard. Now, the, what happened? The slave of Christian master run away. And how do we deal with this? Because it's going to cause not just a church issue, but social issue as well. There's a legal system is completely challenged by this situation. You know, right? But also, we have the standard that all men are equal in the image of God, created by, by, by God, and created in the image of God. We can't condone the slavery. We kind of have a very sticky situation here. But the problem is that there's someone got financially disadvantaged because the slave ran away, right? His property, he lost his property right there. Oh, so, uh, the, the slave, he's, we don't know why he ran away, but he just sick and tired of slavery, so he just want to find his own life. So he's trying to uh, the mingle in the room where there are a lot of slaves are, so he can blend in there. 
Right. Now, the conflicts. Conflicts of the church is real from the day one. And how did they resolve it? How did they resolve it? Okay, now, just stay with me. This is going to be something that can help you in your situation all around your life. Whether it's a family, work, or church. And I'm not just trying to tell you what to do. I'm trying to teach you from the Bible. This is what I actually found in this passage we just read. Right? What I found is that if you want to manage or resolve the conflict, there are three checkpoints. There are three checkpoints you have to go with. Motive, process, and purpose. Motive, process, and purpose. What is your motive? What is the motive when you resolve the conflicts? What is the motive? Now, I want to reiterate once again. In this room, some of you guys are sitting here dealing with the issues with someone else in this room, same room. Some of you in this room got hurt. Some of you guys in this room got offended. Some of you in this room wrestling with the forgiveness still. Right? There is a apparent or hidden conflict. Or some of you guys, you go home, you know there is conflict waiting for you with your mom, your dad, or your brothers or sisters. When you go to work on Monday, there is a conflict waiting for you. The situation you don't like. Now, there are ways to deal with it psychologically or worldly ways. There are many books you can read. Your Google conflict management just comes up. But what I'm teaching you today is that then what is a Christian's way of managing the conflicts? Okay? First thing that you need to, you need to check now before you resolve the conflict is your motive. Is it egocentric? Or is it gospel-centric? Now, you probably already have pastors here again, Christian talk. But this is so important. And I'm going to get a bit angry, right? Because you need to get this. If you don't get this, you get nothing, right? See, when you become a Christian, listen, when you become a Christian saying that I believe in Jesus, that saying that word faith, I believe in Jesus, it is so different to, for to a lot of people using the word I believe in Jesus. When I was younger, I didn't believe in Eskimo because this doesn't make sense to me. People living in the harsh condition, living in this uh, like what's uh, Antarctica or somewhere, you know, with the ice, ha the house made out of ice, you know, what's, what's wrong with that, right? But later it's proven, oh, okay. Oh, that's Eskimo. That's good. So now I believe, I'm a believer, Eskimo believer. I believe in Eskimo. When you come to Christ, say, I believe in Jesus, do you use the same word, having that kind of same weight? In it? Yeah, I believe in Jesus. What do you mean by that? Do you mean saying that, yeah, I agree with you. Now I see that there's a person called Jesus. Okay, he did all that. That's good stuff. No, that faith in Eskimo is completely different to your faith in Jesus because Eskimo's belief, it's got nothing to do with you. You can just agree with it and go on your day and do whatever you want to do. It's got nothing to do with you, right? But when you believe in Jesus, it has to have some impact in your life. In fact, the impact is just so great, it changes you. It just Change upside down. It molds you. It completely takes you out of different world and you become a new humanity. Now, before you are in Christ, who you were, most of people in this world agree with you. We live for ourselves. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, right? We call that egocentric. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. You go and talk to anybody, right? Why do you do this? Because I'm happy with this. I like this. You know, so you put I word right in front of every verb that you come up with. But there's a problem. When you come into Christ, that center, that weight has to be shifted. See, before, you're like about me, me, myself, 
my life, my family, me, 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 my, me, me, you know? It's all about me, what I like, what I want, you know? And so when you feel the conflicts, and what you do is that, you know, I hurt. I got hurt by that. This is how I feel. So, so you actually become the center of all the problems around the world. And you are egocentric. The problem that we're dealing with is when you are Christian, saying that I believe in Jesus, you, nothing got shifted. Nothing be changed there. So you still think that it's me. It's about me, right? Me, my family, my heart, my feeling, you know, how I feel. Me, 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 right? And you're so wrapped up with your own thought, your own feeling, which agreed by the rest of the world, justified by the rest of the world around you. You're fully sitting there completely saturated by the idea of an egocentric world. Be as long as I feel this way, as long as uh, you don't let me feel this way anymore, I'm not going to resolve it. See, there's a problem right there. Now, Paul, how did he resolve the conflict then? You have to get out of your egocentric world and you put gospel in the center of that. Okay, 15, 16, he says this. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while. So, in his explanation, why did Onesimo left you, ran away? He didn't really explain much. But immediately he saw, maybe because so that he can become a Christian. See, let me read to you. That you might have him back forever. So, you might depart him from him, separate him for a while, but you'll have him forever. What do you mean? Because now... You became the citizens in the heaven together, going to the eternity together. He said, no longer as a born servant, but more than a servant. See, you lost a servant, but you gain a brother as a beloved brother, especially to me. And how much more to you both in the flesh, in the Lord. So the way Paul sees a situation is just gospel-centric. Now, I'm going to ask, ask you a very hard question. For those people who are in the conflict right now, do you go to the place where? How does this thing can highlight the good news that I have received from Jesus? How this my hurt, my pain, my struggle, my shame, everything that I'm going through right now, and this person who annoys me, this person who offended me, this person that disadvantaged me or financially ripped me off, and whoever they are, do you go immediately to the place where how God's going to use this situation to manifest His good news to the people around me? See, that is the difference between gospel-centric and egocentric. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. That's why it's a wrestle. You have to wrestle with it. But I want you to wrestle with the right way. Don't wrestle with how I feel, how I hurt, how I need to get justified, how I need to get validated. It's not about me. you more thinking, what is God is doing in this place? What is God's purpose and how He wants me to grow in this place? You know, how God wants to make Him to grow, her to grow through this. So your secret prayer, your secret dialogue with God is about that. It's not just about God, punish Him, get, him, get rid of Him, I'll do something about this so that I can feel better. Right? But I believe in honest prayer. I believe in honest prayer when you have a, such a struggle, internal struggle in your heart and you come to church and you're trying to become like a mature Christian. So like when you pray, like, uh, you, like all you can think of that person really offended you. And it's like, oh, and you just, oh God, I want to be mature. So I want to pray for world peace. You know, it doesn't work that way, right? Just say, God, I hate his face. <laughs> I don't, I don't like him the way he talked to me. I don't like what he did to me. I don't like what, how he operated. You know, I just, just everything that that person represents, it just bothers me. You come to God. But at the end of the day, you check your motive. 
But God, what I truly, truly desire is not me feeling better, but it's about you being glorified. What are you trying to teach me in this? Paul says that through this whole process, I see Philemon, Onesimus, there's a grand picture there. Onesimus was a slave when he was with you. Now he ran away. I know he messed up. He disadvantaged you. He offended you, right? He's a criminal. He done something terrible thing. He got, can be executed. But I'll tell you what. God has a different plan for him and for you. When you receive him as a brother, which is never heard of before, only possible under the power of grace of Jesus Christ, and something, something will be shifted. Not just to you too, but people who are watching you. Wow! And people who 2,000 years later in some country called Sydney and Concord Little High School and people meeting and reading the same passage and saying, that, wow, this is how church should operate. Are you gospel-centric or are you egocentric? Well, I'm shouting a lot today. <laughs> but it's, it's important for all of us to receive this. Okay, number one, motive. Then, how do you process this? How do you process this? Is it justice focus or love focus? Yeah? Justice focus, love focus. This is what Paul said. Verse 8 to 9. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to commend you to do what is required, yet... For love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner, also Christ Jesus. Verse 13, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion by all of your own accord. Okay. Listen to the tone of the Paul here. So when he processed the conflict, right? He know what is right. He know what is wrong. It's nothing wrong with you trying to identify who is the offender, who is the victim. Who did wrong, who didn't do wrong. See, when I say about grace, grace is always found upon when you face the harsh reality of the justice. You cannot just sweep under the carpet and say, oh, yeah, 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 it's okay, it's okay, just move on. That is not grace because you don't feel the weight of the true forgiveness until you face the, that very offense that committed to you, to the people around you. So but Paul is not doing that. But his focus is the way he deals with this always Loving. Right? What he said is this. He's saying, I'm going to tell you what. I tell you that you receive it as a born servant. Uh, that there's a brother. Right? And he said, I'm bold enough to tell you just exactly. Just do it. But I'm not going to do it that way. He said, for love's sake. For love's sake. Because to promote the love between you and me, I prefer to appeal to you. I have a right. See, the biggest issue in the conflict is someone thinks that he has all the right. Someone is thinking that I'm the right and you are wrong. When it's so clear, these people who are in right place, it's so hard to manage the conflict or resolve the conflicts or even bring the any form of forgiveness because you are so right in that sense. Yeah? But if you keep on focusing on who is right and who is wrong, and that, is the, that can be the beginning, but if that is your focus and that's the end, you are never able to experience this amazing grace that God has given to us. Yeah? It's justice focus or love focus. And what, he, what he's saying was quite, quite powerful here as well. He says, Onesimus, he, used, he is useless to you. 
So he was very, very upfront, very kind of a frank about it. He's useless to you. But now he's useful to you. In other words, he was, he's a, uh, profitable. He used to be profitable to you, but he's not profitable to you anymore. But this is a play of a word, you know that? Onesimus, the word, name, means profitable or useful. When he was a slave to Philemon, yeah, he was useful too. Now he ran away. Now he's useless to you. But now because he's in Christ, now he's useful to the kingdom of God. See, what do you see here? I see gospel. I see prodigal son coming back to father. I see the Jesus standing there and through this conflict that all of you people involved see the gospel message. You will not see it until you see the love in this. Until you process it with the love. I'm a big believer in speaking the truth. And some of you guys, especially I think this is the kind of a culture that we have. You know, um, how do I say it? The, um, you don't want to you don't want to offend people. Um, you don't want to really confront. You hate the confrontation. So you avoid the issue. But in your heart, is uh, you're dying. <laughs> yeah? The way I see it is that some of you guys are so hidden in you and start to affect your relationship with God. You can't worship God anymore. When you come to church, this person has offended you and did something wrong to you, just like eat you up. And there's a hardness in your heart grows. You, you know, you know what I'm talking about, isn't it? Even I get that too. Pastors, I just learn how to resolve things faster. But I know how hardness of heart sound like and look like. Yeah? There's no joy in there anymore. And you know what the hardness, how what happened? It doesn't stay there. It grows. It gets bigger if you don't deal with it. It gets harder. It gets bigger. It actually dominates your life. It becomes a bitterness. And later this stage of your life, because your soul, justice focus, you just built up bitterness, built up judgment, built up anger. You never know how to resolve it. What's the resolution there? Love. That extraordinary, supernatural, radical Love, that's what Paul was saying. I can do this just because I have a right to do it, but for the love's sake. And I don't want to force you, but I, wanna, I want to appeal to you so that you can do it by compulsion and your own accord. How loving is that, yeah? In your processing the conflicts, I'll tell you these two things. Be truthful. If you have an issue with someone, Pray hard, take your time, but talk to the person. Talk to the person, this is the issue I have, right? Because I hate to bring the bitterness. I hate hating you. I hate making this hate become dominating my heart. Most of all, I can't deal with this separation between God and me. So here it, here, here it is, my issue. When you say that though, when you speak the truth, what the Bible says, speak the truth in love. How does the love come, come, where does the love come from? Knowing that you were once the offender. You once did the same thing to others as well. That's what Jesus was saying, right? Look at yourself. How can you judge others? But, but when it comes to conflict, because conflict bound to happen when people get together, you are messed up, I'm messed up, you know. We are all sinners. When they come together, of course the conflict will happen, right? But how we resolve is completely different to other people. Is it love focus? You want to promote the love so that actually you process it lovingly, but also I want to love you. End goal is I want to love you, Right? And also gospel center too. Gospel center is, okay, unless you repent and make sure that I like you, I'm not going to like you. You know, unless you, you just completely change and come to me and just on your knee beg me, ask for my forgiveness, I'm not going to forgive you. 
See, sometimes we have that. Sometimes we come to the, uh, the manager conflict that you, you, want the, you want to win. You want to just like, oh, I want to defeat you. So I feel better. Have you ever felt like that? Especially husband and wife, right? Oh, you just want to get into argument. You know, you start with a small thing. You say, why did you do the, I didn't do the dish? Oh, because I was tired and a small chat became I was like, you never do the dish and you never love me and I'll become a bigger and bigger and bigger and stuff. And, and later it becomes something completely different. You just want to, you just forget about the dish now. You just want to win the war right there. You know, I want to be the winner. You shut up. You know? Who is the winner here after that? All the husband and wife. Who is the winner in the battle? Between you two. No one is the winner. No one wins in the, in the conflicts like that. Only way to resolve the issue that I had with my wife is not trying to change her. No, she's not trying to change me. You come to the place where, my goodness, we love each other. Right? And the funny thing, when you lose, you start to win. This one psychologist says, talk about the marriage counseling. When you fight, do you want to win the argument or you want to keep the marriage? Do you want to win the argument or you want to keep the marriage? And that's so profound, isn't it? All right? Sometimes you want to get your way and you're not really getting your way. In the church, do you want to win the argument? Do you want to be the justice, justified person or you want to keep the church together? Unified. Hmm. A lot of times, conflict becomes bigger conflict because you are not dealing lovingly. Sometimes, truth, uh, tr- uh, the conflict becomes much worse than that because you are not being truthful. That's what I found. Can you be truthful? Lovingly. Can he be truthful? Lovingly. There was a time in my ministry, someone came to Pastor Joshua, I got something to share with you. She probably trying to apply this principle. Came to me. Pastor Josh, what you said the other day on the pulpit, this, 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 that hurt me, that hurt me, that hurt me, that hurt me. I feel better. See, she walked away. Literally, the conversation went like that. And I was like, stand there. I was like, something hit me right there, right? And she felt relieved and went away. All right? Then what happened? I got hurt. <laughs> so what do I do with this hurt? So I go and grab her. And go, okay. This is what I'm happy with you. With you, with you, with you. Okay, that's good. So feel good. I go away. And we can go back and forth, ping pong, all the way through, right? Somewhere, somehow, sometime, someone has to forgive and move on, right? What is that? What is that very action of forgive and moving on? What is that called biblical concept? Agape, love. And I think when that person did it to me, she believed I'm a pastor, I'm mature enough to take it. Of course, so I took it. I asked for her forgiveness and I prayed for her and she sent away. Of course, I went home, and I'd cry out to God, God, something wrong with this woman, right? But I loved her. I chose to love her. And she turned around, became a powerful leader of the church. Now, what I'm saying is this. Onesimus, watch it, later, this slave, runaway slave, big fugitive slave, became a bishop of the church in the history of the church church history and led church. And his name popped up a few times here and there as a slave. How that on earth happened? I don't think it was a justice. If it was justice to be served, he should have an F sign on his forehead or he should go back to mass and get slayed or the executed. Yes, that would satisfy everybody, right? No. It will not satisfy God at the end of the day. So in your conflicts, who are you satisfying? Who are you trying to satisfy here? That leads me to the next point, my last point. Then what's the purpose? You got to think about the, what's the purpose of the conflict resolution. 
Is that the prophet or is that obedience? Is that a prophet? Meaning, you want to get out of this, you want to get upper hand, you want to get, feel better, you want to somehow, you want to resolve it in a way so that you don't feel that hurt anymore, right? So think about it. What do you really want? Or is that the obedience? Jesus had a conflict once, just right before the cross. He was praying to God, God, please remove this cup from me. It's just so hard. I don't like it. I don't want it. And what he did was that it's not profitable for me. It's not profitable. It's just so painful, right? But what he did at the end of prayer is that, but not my will, but your will be done. That goes down to the history of all church, everybody who followed Jesus. That's why I'm saying conflict is a necessary journey of the school of discipleship. You following Jesus? This is how God, Jesus, resolved the conflict. This is how Jesus prayed. This is the purpose of Jesus' way of dealing with his internal struggle. He's saying, ultimately, God, I want you to be highlighted. I want to obey your will, not my will. What's your purpose in your conflict resolution? You want to get the profit. You want to get what you want, or you want to have the obedience. Okay, listen to this. Philemon 1722. So, if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If you have wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of you owing me, even your own self. So, what he was saying, okay, listen, listen carefully, all right? What Paul was saying is this. Philemon, if he disadvantaged you, if you want the profit, I'll pay it. I'll pay it. But I want you to remember, okay, I'm saying very carefully. I, I didn't say that. Paul said that. He said, but remember, you owe me your life, man. You wouldn't become a Christian without my ministry. So you owe me. And I'm not asking for anything. But if you feel that you need to get repaid, I'll pay back. I'll pay back. But now, he continues saying, verse 21, confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. So he's saying, but you know what? I believe that you will choose obedience at the end of the day. Can I be a bit more personal here as a pastor? One of the hardest people that I deal with in the church is the people who are saying, I'm not obeyed to anyone but God. Now, people say that. It's theologically so correct and all that stuff, but they, in their heart is that. What he was basically saying is that I'm the God. I decide what I want. You know, I decide what I need. I will not disadvantage. I'm not going to get any, I'm not going to be feel belittled. I'm not going to feel uh, offended. I'll make sure that I get what I want. That's and they connect with, I only listen to God. I'm not going to listen to anyone. I say this very carefully. But do you know, the biggest, clearest sign of people's obedience is your obedience to your pastor. Come on. Have I ever asked you guys, hey, do this, do that? No, I don't, I don't operate that way. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, sometimes you need to listen to your pastor. See, I deal with conflicts daily basis. Like, small thing like a house church, who goes to where, right? Which some of you guys are dealing with that right there. You know? And I see, I talk to everybody and have all sorts of different opinions. I hear it. I try to make sure that everybody get to get what they want and you know, they, they deserve and so they can be happy. But there are many times, do you know, there are many times there is no absolute solution there. If I Choose this, this person will get sad. If I choose this, this person gets There's so many situations like that. And there are times, not this church, you guys are very obedient people. I'm telling you, you guys are really good. I'm talking about the other church. 
right? I'm not going to name that. The other church. I feel like I'm always like a kindergarten teacher. Like, a, you know what kindergarten look like? You know, kindergarten, you know, you know what I'm doing. Like, you know, you go there, everybody crying. So, oh, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. King, you're just changing diaper. And the other person, oh, it's okay. You're just feeding him. To make sure that no one cries, right? No one is mature. Everybody cries. I me, mean, me, myself, me, myself, my, 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 you know, my feeling, my hurts, my experience, my joy, my me, 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 right? A few days ago, I was having a shepherd's meeting, and we are struggling with how to make the house church better. I'm not going to go into details. I just couldn't find the right answer at this situation for our church. So I asked the, one of the shepherds there, but at the end of the day, can you just submit to me? And he said, yes, of course. Of course. Yeah, I don't like it. It's not really about whether I like it or not, but it's about I trust you as my leader. I trust you. As a, someone who God has put in your, my spiritual walk. So I submit to you. What happened there? Conflict resolved. God be glorified. Your pastor got happy. Obedience. What is the purpose of your conflict resolution? Do you want to grow through obedience? Or do you want to be your own God, get you what you want? I'm telling you, that's how you break up your marriage. That's how you mess up your life. That's how you always have this bitterness in your heart because you want to manage your own life. You want to be your own God. You never obey to anyone, not even to God. God is just some Eskimo out there. I believe in you, but you got nothing to do with me. That is you then you never get to the place where you truly experience this kind of powerful story in your life, the perfect, heavenly, gospel-centered, spiritual resolution. And you never see people being changed, transformed inside and out. I love this Philemon, this short message, how Paul is just pouring his house out and being very practical and telling Philemon, if you obey, something crazy will happen. Now, listen to this. Listen. Do you know what is at stake right now? When Onesimo goes back, he could get caught. He could get died, executed right there. The crazy thing is to me, it's actually Onesimus agreed to Paul. He ran away, right? No runaway fugitive go back to the master. But just with the one letter from the Paul, he's saying, you know what? I met Jesus, and what he did to me is so powerful. I'm not a slave anymore. I'm a slave to God. I'm a free man. I'll do what you tell me to do. He goes back to the master. And Philemon, Philemon, Philemon. You know, later we know he did exactly what Paul told him to do. He didn't mind. You know what? You're an expensive slave, but I'll let you go. It's not about me getting money or it's not about profit, but it's about obedience. Just a short story that I'll finish it off. Wow, 12.30. Short story. There was a long, long time ago, someone came to me. Say, Pastor Josh, I need money. How much? A few thousand dollars. Why do you come to me? Because I got no one to go. Um, why do you need it? Oh, because I need to pay rent. I had a suspicion, to be honest, because there several people came to my life thinking that I'm so. I don't know why people come to me, man. I don't have money. I have a wife. <laughs> and my wife and I sit down and pray. What do you do about this? I know we're going to get ripped off. We knew it. But there was something that my wife said, <laughs> it's just about this woman. You know, she, she earns money so hard way, right? She said, I think there's something worth to risk. If it's, or it's a way that he receives here the love of Jesus Christ, 
Maybe we should. And I said, but you know, there's a huge chance we may not get that money back. It's like, yep, it's okay. So we stupid enough to give the person money, and he ran away and never came back to church. <laughs> of course, that happened. It happens to several times. But somehow, we didn't have the bitterness because we talked through. We talked about what is the motive here? Eh? Of course, I don't give money away like that every time, right? I don't have that much money. So, oh, Pastor Josh, I got to go to No, no, please don't. But that time, there was time that when the Holy Spirit was spoke to my, my heart, right? So I felt like God is trying to do something for Him and for me as well. So, check out more of it. Is it gospel center? Yes, gospel driven. And is it loving or righteous? Just justice or love? Yep. I gave Him stern warning. If you use this for your drug money, whatever, then, you know, then I, you know what? I'm going to find you, right? So, yeah, 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 right. And later, I had to obey to God. And he ran away. Up until now, we still haven't that, don't have that few thousand dollars in our bank account. But do you know what happened later? About two weeks later, I got this random text message from Malaysia. So pastor Josh, a pastor from this church. And now we prayed, and now your name popped up. We're going to give you money. This is not money for the church, it's for you and your wife. Spend for yourself. Exactly $1,000 more than what we gave to the person. But it's not just this, this several times in my life when we act obediently. That's a supernatural work that God does. And that's why I get to say this to you guys. It's not some kind of theory that I come up with that sounds good, but it's a life testimony that when you seek His kingdom and righteousness first, when you know how to obey to God, sometimes, like, you know, kind of a crazy way, then God shows up. And my thing for all of you is that how many of you guys, have you ever experienced this kind of supernatural Work of God in your life. Do you have that testimony? Is it because you never get to give the God chance? You are always egocentric, justice focused, profit based. Oh, you never get this. Summary Conflict is a man necessary journey in the school of discipleship. Three checkpoints. What's your motive? how you process it, and purpose. Motive is egocentric versus gospel-centric, justice-focused, love-focused, profit versus obedience. Let the Word of God encourage you and convict you and confront you today. Let's pray.